So, welcome back. Um, we had a couple of problems. You probably all got an email that we stepped down from organizing this um, group. This was um, just a, a communication problem in um, prolonging the meetup subscription. So worry not, we will stay. We had a little bit of a, um, a busy time. This is why we skipped October, but we will be back at least um, on a monthly basis, probably even more frequent than um, like we did before, like a three a week rhythm or so, or we will find something that um, a format that we can um, present in the middle of the one month um, interval. Then um, I think I don't have to introduce myself. Um, I think I know basically almost all of you here personally. Um, hi, I'm Marco. And uh, you will not hear a lot of me today because we have two amazing speakers with um, topics that will like uh, be complementary to each other. If you did not do so yet, please go to slackcommunity.spryker.com and get an invite for our Slack community. I think at the moment, most of you are already there. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have found the Zoom link. Um, if not, do that now. Today, we will talk about all things data import. And for that, we have um, Alberto Asman from Smart Commerce here. And um, we have or will have um, Bernd Alter from Turbine Kreuzberg here. And both will tell us something about data import and how they um, optimize the specific aspects of the data import during their projects. But um, yeah, I think that um, they will introduce themselves and also can present the topics better than I can sum them up. And with this, I would actually directly pass to Alberto to present us the first one. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be there. And let's give me, oh yeah, it's just, you had the screen, still have the screen. So now you can see something. Oh, so yes, no, all good. Uh, yes, we can see. Yes. Good. I also I have to mention, sorry, um, yep. we record this thing. Um, none of you will be seen apart from the speakers and the speakers will sign something that we are allowed to share this and we will publish this probably on youtube later okay good um yeah i will take you on a journey today my on the one hand my personal journey on the other hand a journey about performance performance of the importers in spiker um spiker and i am are very connected. I was one of the first Spryker developers. Um, I've also seen René is here today. Hello, René. Hi. Nice to see you again <laughs> after this long time. Yep. Um, not like René, um, I stepped down from the project or from Spryker. I had a lot of other opportunities and worked in the, yeah, worked in other departments afterwards. Um, but let's start with November 2014. That was when we first bought the first demo shop from Spiker Live. And I remember, I'm not sure if the numbers are very correctly, but I remember that at this time, an import for, for example, for a product was around a second per product. That was pretty fast. And the import at this time was not decoupled like it is today with this event bus in between, but it was pretty straightforward and would land in the Redis cache within this second. So that was pretty fast and nice. Um, in May 2016, I had the chance to work with Spiker again, which was pretty nice, with one of the first um, customers who got live. It's called Wine and Black. Um, They've announced a few days back that they had a major deal and a major merging process with a bigger wine company. Um, so they are growing pretty fast, which is nice. Uh, but at the time, we were there to help them and yeah, implement their or get rid of their old in-house built shop and use a Spiker base instead. Um, it was a little bit slower than a second, but still getting a product from their ERP system or PIM system, but uh, name it PIM system, what they have built into Spryker and see it in the front and was around a second, maybe two seconds 
something like that. So then I no longer had the chance to work with uh, Spryker for several years. And end of December, I got the chance to work again with Spryker in a different project, which is called Craft Supply. That's the current project we, we will talk about today and where we'll line out some improvements we have made in terms of performance there. Um, yeah, basically when I joined the project uh, beginning of December, 2018, that was the day where they presented their first, let's say proof of concept. That didn't have to be perfect. It just was yeah, some sort of, of demonstration that we can build a big e-commerce platform with Spryker. Um, one of the biggest issue we had from the very beginning was that importing a much simpler entity than product, um, the stock entity or availability entity was pretty, pretty slow. Sure, we had a lot of data, not a lot, but some amount of data uh, around 320,000 entries, but the whole import took around 16 hours. That was too heavy not fast enough, especially for things like availabilities you want to sync on a um, on a faster base. So that was the first problem. I love solving problems. So we took or we, we digged into the problem. And one thing we've learned from that was that if we have many simple entries, like in this case, that was just a simple CSV file with uh, in which, what, what is this called? Um, um, where can you buy this, this SKU and how many uh, are on stock? Nothing more than that. So a low complexity, but many entries. Um, first thing was that we've analyzed how is that done, importing such data. So you probably are familiar with this workflow. We have a CSV file, read this line by line. And then for each line, we check if the availability is already there, then we create it or do an update. If it's not already there, we create this uh, entity and put it into the database. Mm. There are a few common approaches when it comes to tuning performance of an, yeah, of an importer. You can read in batches. This is something Spryker can uh, can do by default. The batch size is just uh, increased or decreased by a config. Um, and you can load in batches and write in batches. We will come to that in a minute. Um, but for this case, we could do it without any, any Spryker code. We just analyzed. And you can imagine if you have, let's say, 100,000 products, not all 100,000 products are bought in the same frequency. Some are bought maybe once a year. Some are bought on a daily basis. Um, so if you have, like in our case, availabilities, they will not completely change. Not all 320,000 abilities will change every minute, but just a few will change very often. Um, yeah. On, if you have such a situation, the simplest thing you can do is don't import everything. Do a diff before so that you know what is new and what stayed unchanged since last time. I would just go quickly over this. I will not explain it in detail. Uh, so I will also share the slides maybe uh, in the, in the afterwards so you can see what we did here. We just use standard Unix tools to, oh, sorry, to basically, I'm just too dumb to use a computer. So yeah, to basically diff large files against each other. And if the availability import, that's the third point at the very end was successful, we can save the diff file to compare it the next time. Um, that saved us a lot of time. I'm not exactly sure how much time anymore, but it got down to around 10 minutes or something like this. That because we had 
very, very few products which change often. Um, second problem we have with product import. Our product export from our um, yeah, partner was a big, big JSON file. Um, JSON is a format which is pretty hard to unpack and to keep completely in memory. And we were aware at this point in time that the, in the next few months, our partner will increase the, their product size. So basically they will, um, they try to double their products. So the 400 MB JSON would be 800 MB in the next few weeks. So we had the need for a solution there. Here, our problem was basically to read a big file in memory. This can easily be solved by using a stream parser where um, a stream parser for JSON is pretty hard to write. So use dieses, this PC worth JSON reader. He's already implemented a, a stream parser, which is pretty good. But one thing we've missed in the stream parser was to calculate how many entries are in there? Um, the cool solution will be to use a tool called JQ. JQ is some, somehow similar to CREP, um, but for JSON files. If JQ is not available, or if the file is even too big for JQ, you can also do it the old fashioned way, use a CREP uh, command and put it to uh, WC minus L uh, to count on the lines. So that's how we brought back the counts, basically. That was the only thing which was missing for us when we used streamline parsing. So we could show um, um, what's Fortschritts bar, basically a progress bar for our imports. We are fine with this solution for many months, but then our next big project started. started. Um, we migrated every product data into a very, very big PIM system. Um, we onboarded a lot of uh, suppliers and um, other partners to give us data about their products. And with this migration to a PIM system, we also had the need to migrate to a new format. In XML format, we could yeah, somehow define, but this was the perfect moment for us to have a deeper look into how can we speed up the imports. Um, yeah, just a quick recap, how are in, um, imports done? Basically, a line is read from, a, from an XML or a product in this case. Then we have to look up in the database for certain entities, so for example, for a product, for the related product image and so on and so forth. If they are there, if they are there, then we do an update. If not, then we do a uh, create statement. So if we only have a product and a product image, we already have four queries. That's pretty much. If we uh, have a lot of products and multiply this by four queries, then we have we end up in one million queries, something like that. So we had to tackle this problem as well. Spryker already brings a solution for this, which is called uh, I think CTE importers. You call it internally, yep. something alike. Um, basically, the idea here is to, on one hand, to enable batches, so you don't have to read line by line, but can have read, for example, 100 products. And on the other hand, let the database do the, the work of checking if the entity is already there or if it has to be created from scratch within the database. Um, yeah, basically this is in Postgres, this is done with this on conflict clause. I'm pretty sure that MySQL uh, already has something in place since a few uh, years, I think since version seven, but I haven't touched MySQL uh, since 
years. I'm pretty happy with the Postgres uh, database. Yeah, that was basically, we just used the Spryker approach, but this was still not fast enough. Um, as I already mentioned, we had to batch that. This is pretty much done by using uh, an, an pack and unpack mechanism. So basically you pre-process all your entries you want to write into the database or the data you have read from the XML file, pack it into one JSON parameter or one parameter per um, attribute you want to put into the database and have the uh, opposite function in the database, which is unnest in um, Postgres. I'm not really sure if there is such a pack unpack mechanism in MySQL. So if you want to use these CTE uh, importers, you have to have uh, Postgres in place. Maybe Marco, you can correct me if this I has can changed. can elaborate on that uh, when you are done. Yeah. Okay, that's nice. Um, yeah, basically this was the first thing. We can batch, let's say 100 or 1000 of products into one or write it into one big batch, pack them and unpack them in the database and then use our magic with um, create or update with this absurd statements. Um, we have still found a little tweak we could use to improve the performance in some uh, importers. We have improved the performance by 50% uh, again of that. Spryker at this time had used two, no, three CTE statements, one to unpack what you want to write in the database, then want to build a change set for all um, entities we, which are new, which need to be inserted, and one for all uh, entities which can be updated. I think the reason why they did that was that uh, for new entities, you need to fetch the next primary key from a sequence, which is here in line five, this next value is by product, product image. PK, PK sequence. Um, we just have used Coalesc, which is basically, um, so we join the table where we want to know or want to insert that. And by this join, we can use the Coalesc operator to see if we have already an ID, then we need an update, which will be done by this uh, on conflict clause. If not, we can fetch the next value from the sequence and have our primary key in there. So basically with this uh, coalesce statement and the join line three and line nine, we could improve the performance of the importers further. I've worked on the importers for I think two to three months or something like that. And we created a few importers. And within this time, it come obvious that it is pretty, pretty hard to write importers um, with the CTE schemes because you put a lot of logic into the database. And if you have a big product set, maybe you have side effects from the unpack or from the pack commands. Um, to test them, we had uh, around 370,000 products at this moment. Um, when you wanted to test this and imported all products, it took around four hours. So for each try to, I, I run and where I wanted to find the issue, I had to run a four hour long command, which was not pretty handy, you can imagine. Um, it was also pretty hard to, to debug because if you have, let's imagine you have 1000 rows, you insert them in uh, 10, uh, in, in batches of 10. And in the last row, you have an issue. Now you fire up your xdebug and the whole process of importing them all becomes slower and slower and slower. And you wait for hours until your breakpoint comes into place and you can debug this. So developing um, data imports was pretty hard for us. Um, we had to come up with a solution to 
we gain our development speed there. Um, one of the solutions can be, and it was for us pretty handy, to write automated tests. So basically build a test framework, which makes it easy to write a test first if you encountered an issue. Then you can either use this test to debug only this issue or to solve this issue and have a proof afterwards that it was solved for sure. Um, we had to take a short path here and only test it until the database. So basically the whole import, reading the file, uh, processing it and set and putting it into the database is tested from, from us, but we don't test that afterwards the publishing and synchronized mechanism works as it should be. Um, that's for now, that is fine. Uh, testing an asynchronous mechanism like publish and synchronize is pretty hard. So we didn't want to solve this issue. Um, yeah, in addition, we also created, yeah, somehow a test helper where we can easily build a whole catalog. So this XML we get from, um, from the PIM system, we can easily build here and only have to, we have a lot of default values behind that structure and only have to change the values we really want to test. And then you can see we have overwritten the um, Q client. So basically during the test run, we completely disable the rabbit and Q. We don't want to interact with that. Yeah, and then we can just fire up our importer. It's basically some sort of integration test. And afterwards we do assertions on the database itself. So if the column, um, let's say uh, URL was written and has the right value inside. That had helped us a lot, especially when we encountered bugs. So we had one bug, which was pretty, pretty hard to, um, to find because there were two entries following after each other were interacting with each other. And that was somehow nearly impossible to rebuild as test case, except with this testing framework, it was possible for us. Yeah. Um, we rebuild with each test run, we rebuild our complete database for the test. That's why we have created a separate test database on our local machines. Um, yeah, with that approach, we can also ensure that um, everything is set up right. So one of my colleagues, I think he's here today, Stefan has also improved this by using um, the Spiker installers for this separate test system. So basically we create transfer objects, we create uh, database migrations from Propel, execute them against the database and things like that. So we can know by running the tests, everything works fine in the import layer. Yeah, um, just to sum it up quickly, what we've learned are four key takeaways for us. If you have simple, Data which is volatile means changes in a few lines very often. You can uh, use a diff approach to, to get the size of this file a lot small, smaller and only import the things who have changed. But this is only possible for simple file formats like uh, CSV. If you have big input files and you can't read them all in memory at once, use stream parsing. And if you have a lot of queries, then first thing, batch them. Second thing, use absurd um, yeah, and you will be fine. And if you want to get the most out of this in terms of development speed, take your time, do a good test framework you can use. This will, in the first step, slow you down but in the middle term and in the long run, it will very, very much speed up your development uh, when it comes to the data importers. 
here. That's what we've learned. And I'm pretty much looking forward to see what Turbine Kreuzberg there can, can tell us what they have learned working with the Spiker importers. Before that, I would like to ask if there are any questions. Oh. <laughs> then I could steal uh, your screen share now, but it's basically just announcing Bernd when so there are I, no other questions. I, I just want to add, uh, so, sorry, yes. No, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to add that, uh, thank you very much, Albert. I think it's, it's great to see that uh, you also uh, tune that part with the call sec. I think this is also really great uh, boosting. Regarding the CTE, yes, I think CTE is, as you said, is a common table expression and it exists. I think it exists in the MySQL, but I think the syntax is a bit slightly different. Honestly, I couldn't run it <laughs> on MySQL also uh, because of some uh, syntaxing, it was not so easy. But uh, in Postgre, I think there is one limitation. I would like to also add it. Uh, in one of our projects, when we reach to the more than, I think, 60 million records, we see some, uh, let's say, table locking. It mm -hmm. looks like uh, the memory, uh, the table at some point Postgre will lock the whole table when it reached to the some threshold of the records. This is a still, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we still uh, couldn't find a solution for it. And uh, so, uh, I need to actually like, take a look at it. I, I actually, my question is, have you ever experienced this problem? Um, no, not yet. Mm -hmm. We don't have 6 million uh, entries yet. I think 60 Tables. million, I think it should be 60 million. Okay, 60, uh, yeah. yeah. Still, we don't have that much data. We have a lot of products, but I think the biggest table is around 350,000 lines, which is still okay for us. So we don't have encountered that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I cannot really give you an advice or mm -hmm. a hint where to look at. No, no, that's 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 fine. But I think uh, yeah, uh, some some project is faced, but some project is still uh, quite okay with it. Yeah. Are you sure that this is uh, related to table locks? Because um, what I know from the CTEs in Postgres, if they get too big, that's also why you should avoid having three or four CTEs in the same query. They get persist to disk, which can slow down the whole process. So increasing your batch size um, to, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 mm -hmm. or something like that can trigger this persisting of the CTE to disk and then you end up slower than than mm -hmm. before. So mm -hmm. I'm not well, sure what, if this is your problem. Well, uh, I, we, we actually checked that the, the Postgre yeah. locking and it was the table lock. After okay. I think 10 million, it's fully, it's a one lock and even proper uh, insert was much faster. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's actually, I think it's a drawback that uh, even may, maybe it's a problem for, for Postgre a specific version and, but I still, I need to check it. Yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of, I wanted to elaborate on that. So um, the problem with MySQL is not CTE um, that's supported until uh, MySQL 8, like the version that came out last year or the year before, um, which is already quite late because CTEs are actually part of the SQL 99 uh, standard. And um, the problem here is that we have a um, parameter limit on PDO like 65,000, whatever, the, um, the uh, yeah. power of two. And um, we have to use array parameters that we then unpack with this unnest operation that Alberto showed. And um, this is an, an by no means available in MySQL. There are also like very um, active threads in their forums where um, people keep requesting array parameters, but it just, like they don't do that. I know that internally we are currently working on um, a rather naive approach. I think it's um, a bit with um, string um, combining and string splitting that should work in the background actually. So it's um, transparent um, from you, mostly at least, but I do not want to spoil too much. And I also don't know the official timeline. I know that the first tests are already um, successful with that. That's it from my side. Cool. Thank you. And um, I will steal your screen share now. Yeah, please do so. And the only thing I do that for is to go one slide ahead and say, 
now we are hearing how Tobino Kreuzberg is actually um, handling things around what Alberto just told us. Now it's your time, Bernd. Yeah, hi. Um, nice to be back. I haven't, uh, haven't been attending any, any meetups for quite some time. Um, but uh, yeah, now this, uh, since the, we are right in the, in the current project, we were concerned a lot with uh, in, um, optimizing importers. I thought I'd uh, yeah, sneak in and, and add my two or three cents to this topic. Um, yeah, so it's about mastering the imports. About me, I'm an Alta technical director at Tobino Kreuzberg. Uh, you could say early adopter of Spryker. So we worked uh, with even the unofficial version of Spryker and launched the first project with this. And uh, if you want to, you can contact me or write me on, or follow me on, on Twitter. But let's go into the topic. So. Um, I will not go so much into the, how actually this, this works with the bulk processing and how CTEs work in general, um, because uh, this yeah, was already covered. And, and you can also look this up in the Spryker documentation. You can have a look at the existing uh, importers, the bulk processing importers. I wanted to go more into the like uh, nitty gritty things um, we discovered, especially over the last couple of weeks also. Um, and so by default, the Spryker importer or Spryker comes with the default importers, which are atomic. So that you process this one data set at a time. And um, some of the major drawbacks for me are here, like there's no check for inconsistencies and uh, they, they fail uh, on any, each and every error that you encounter. Like for example, you have uh, uh, some data that is just wrong, whether you have a missing key or something else happens so this is then the import is just failing and uh yeah and, and the wor the worst thing about this atomic processing this one by one is of course the, the performance issue uh which Alberto already mentioned so the solution is of course this bulk processing with the cpes and um to start just with a simple example so with the image import um because there a lot of the, the complexity is, is involved that uh, I want to talk about. So in the image import, uh, you, of course, uh, no surprise, you import the images, um, but also the image sets. And then this image to image set relation, this is what is um, written there. Of course, you in the end, you trigger some events for the published sync and uh, you need to resolve because in the CSVs you, you have to just the SKUs, of course, no, no IDs, no primary keys, no foreign keys uh, that you would need for persisting the data. And uh, this will be, then this needs to be retrieved. So um, for the image import, uh, let's go with this example where you have a CSV file with 60,000 images and uh, for 10,000 products with two locales and assume we have three images per product and locale. So this adds up to 140,000 queries uh, done during the import. If you go with a one by one approach, each data set and, and you um, do these selects and so on. So you have to uh, select, do selects for the SKU ID mapping. You have to do selects for the locales, which is because it's just two, it's not so, so much, but still two more queries, but then um, you end up with these lots of inset update queries for the images, image sets and the image set relations. So this is quite a lot. And um, if you do this then with bulk processing and upserts, it basically boils down to this. So you have per batch, you have just six queries the way we did it. Um, we just have one select for getting the SKU ID mappings. Uh, one select for, uh, so for the abstracts and the concretes, because you can have the images either bound to the pro concrete product or to the abstract product. So one of each is, is uh, set. Um, then we have one select for the locales and we do one insert update statement, one CTE for the image sets, one for the images and one for the relations. So it's six per batch. If you assume you have a batch of 5,000, per so, uh, 5,000 data sets, then by for 60,000 images or entries, you have five, uh, 12 batches, 12 uh, times six is 72. So you end up with just 72 queries for the whole thing. So uh, way better. Um, 
So what we came across here is um, because it, some might argue that you don't even need these select statements for the SKU's uh, IDs to retrieve these, these foreign keys. But um, this, if you want to manage also your data inconsistencies, then you shouldn't do this because um, on um, in the in this example query, which is very simplified and, and limited, and there's some parts even missing. Um, as you can see, there's there's this inner join where you uh, retrieve the um, the ID, or you can can get the foreign key, the ID of the product abstract within your CTE. And then you do the insert um, by just using this and you just pass the CTE query, the SKU, which would be totally fine. If in an ideal world, um, your data is always in a consistent stage, which of course, as developers, we know this is never the case and you cannot assume this. So you have to somehow deal with this because um, if you would do it like this, then you would end up um, with a query that just ignores the, the entries, the, the data sets where you couldn't find a matching product abstract. And it would just like silently ignore this. And you would, um, let's say you have a hundred data sets of, and 10 of them are referencing uh, abstract products that do not even exist. Then you would end up with 90 uh, records in your database and 10 were, uh, would be missing and you would never know if you don't look into the database or if someone uh, just come, comes across this and is wondering why that is this not, um, why, why don't we have images or why are there not so uh, many images in the database as I've uh, imported. So this is an issue and uh, we want to know about this. So this is um, why we do kind of a pre-processing, which is done in these atomic importers by Spryker with, with the um, data uh, set, uh, with the data steps, I think they're called. Um, so this is done before and, and on each and every data set, and, but we don't want to do it like that. And we want to identify those data sets where, uh, where we have inconsistencies in the data. We want to, first of all, skip them um, because otherwise, um, it would break the import and we don't want to break the import. We also just don't want to cancel the import. So we just skip them. Uh, we want to have proper logging for this and we want to make this uh, visible then in the stats. So what we did is, I hope you can kind of read it. Um, in the first, so we have a one prepared, uh, one, sorry, one uh, CTE where we just uh, pass the SKUs and get the uh, IDs back along with the SKU. So we get this mapping table, you can say. Then uh, we pass this to a PHP function before we do it, the actual persistent. So the create, uh, so the insert or update. And um, I hope you can kind of read it. So the red parts here is, so we add this, uh, if we figure out there is actually um, uh, no entry for an SKU in the database. We couldn't find any ID. Then we add this to an array, which is then locked later on because um, first we, we were logging this on the fly. So doing a log uh, uh, call on each and every missing SKU, but uh, we figured out that this slows down the import significantly. So we just first collect all of this and then lock this per batch. And uh, the next thing uh, with the next red comment uh, is where we count this and we pass this then back to the, um, to the importer. Um, so we just tell the importer, well, a certain amount of, of uh, data sets have failed on import um, because the, the data importer, so this has to be bubbled up kind of uh, back to the importer um, because uh, at that point, the uh, data sets have already been processed because they are just get flashed after the batch size is reached. So there's no way on marking this on the data set itself while it's read. And uh, the last thing is then that we, if we have uh, an entry for the SKU or whatever that is, then we map it into the data set, into the data collection. And the last thing is that we, um, 
just so here you, you might see if if we go back to this slide here we had this inner join to get the mapping the, the foreign key and here we don't have this in the uh, initial query so here we just pass the um, the entries the data the parameters into the query and then we do the insert the update whatever is needed to do so this is how to to deal with the data inconsistencies um, another thing that we changed uh, from the like in regards to the bot processors we saw in spryker is that we saw that there you always have this incident update and then the touched um, ids or the, the ids of the touched entries are passed back but for updates this was always uh, so it was done either an insert if it's necessary or an update and with the update it was just updated so it, um, it didn't check uh, whether there is any change data at all or not so it was just running this update and uh, of course the database engine can figure this uh, out by, by itself if an operation is needed so this will be optimized but still you will get back the id for this entry even though it might not have been updated um like uh, like really updated so it was just somehow checked uh, but not really updated and so we always do this check on each and every field um, that we want to update and, and only actually run the update if we really have a change in the data this slows down the process a little bit but um, we figured that it didn't have such a big effect that uh, we were, would rather not do this. So um, this helps a lot on, on just getting back the touched entries, the really updated entries. And um, the one drawback of this is if in case um, you need to touch later on um, subsequent data, like for example, relations in this example with the image importer you have the image sets you import the images you import and then later on you have to write the relations so it might happen that you write a new image but the image set is not uh, touched because it didn't change uh, but you still need the id of the image set to pass it on later on for the for writing the relations so for this case you then need to collect the ids of the image sets or whatever you need um, that you're missing. So um, we run then always an additional query to fetch the IDs of the unmodified um, data sets. So this is also an additional uh, query, but still cheaper than, than, uh, than for example, uh, triggering all these events. Because if you think about uh, like this is 60,000 is not really a lot. Uh, we were dealing with systems where we had a couple of million entries and if you um, think about uh, triggering always events for uh, a million images or products or whatever this might cause a lot of load on the system for publishing that is not necessary at all um, and next thing um, which is also the final thing i wanted to uh, talk about here is to check your batch size um, I was mentioning that uh, the large batch size can cause problem. This is uh, right because you have to take into account certain um, certain limitations. So you, of course, you need to uh, check if your batch size is uh, is is somehow causing too much load on the for PHP or for the database server. For example, if you have a really really large batch size. This might increase the memory usage for PHP and you might run into memory limit issues. Um, same for database servers. Also, you might have limitations because the, the parameters um, are passed as strings to the query and there might be a limitation for the length of the string you can pass to the query. So, um, and if you have, for example, um, we had an an example of, uh, import where we had to import large um, amounts of text for each and every entry. This could be, I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers, but I uh, the, the CSV file with about 
I think it was like 100,000 uh, entries and the CSV file was about half a gigabyte uh, uh, big. And so basically all of this would, would be passed uh, to the query as well. And um, so this might overwhelm either PHP or the database server. So, so you have to play a little bit with the batch size for your imports. For us, five to 10,000 works pretty fine. Um, also, you have to keep in mind that um, at some point this, this doesn't increase your performance. So of course, in the beginning when you have very small batch sizes, um, it takes a lot more time than having really large batch sizes. But at some point, it doesn't matter if you have like 10,000 or 20,000 or 30,000, and then you should maybe rather go with a more conservative value. So this was basically it, what I wanted to, to add to this topic. And just to brag a little bit, um, this is what we achieved by switching from the atomic importers to the bulk processing. So we went down from almost eight hours of import to just 17 minutes. And uh, we could uh, improve the performance by, or we could reduce the execution time by 90%. And the average factor, as you can see here, was almost uh, factor 100, some really high, some not so much. And this was a, for a database or for a system with around 100, yeah, 100, 200,000 um, products and all the required uh, entities as well. So of course there's there are a lot uh, more data imported, but for some this was just a little bit of data, and or the importers were already quite fast. So this were the ones that we improved, plus some uh, specific product ones. But um, this helped a lot, and we could probably even improve those a little bit more. So we could go maybe down to ten minutes for this whole import. So, and with this, I would be ready for taking some questions if you have some. If you need to validate the uh, product data during import or why you import them for consistency reasons, if I got this right, mm -hmm. have you thought of um, importing them, them into a separate table before, do some validation on the table, and then do some sort of a blue green line deployment just on the database side? That's how we tackled that uh, for Weiland, basically. Mm -hmm. um would be a valid approach. Um, the, the reason why we do this in this system, there's a middleware, which is uh, basically a data layer that is collecting all the data from uh, back office systems, ERP, PIM, et cetera, doing all the heavy lifting, the, the aggregation and so on, and then doing Delta exports. So um, in theory, the data should already be validated and we should already get only the proper data but um, turned, uh, turned out that there are still some issues, some bugs within the system and they exported inconsistent data and this was breaking then the imports. And um, of course you could, could uh, argue that they should fix this on their side and, and uh, export proper data, but uh, then we would have been stuck with a non-functional, non-working import for a couple of days, couple of weeks maybe and this could happen at any time again. And so we figured it's better to have this consistency check in during the import and it doesn't really slow down the import. So the imports were all really, really fast. So if you have a look at this, so this is the, the, the second colored uh, column is the, the runtime in seconds. And so if it's just like 10 seconds, 50 seconds or whatever, then I don't care so much if this takes two, three, four more seconds to validate the data. Yeah, got this. We did this uh, the different approach. Um, we have a PIM system which takes care of the validation, mm -hmm. and we trust them that they do this right. And to be really honest, they are pretty good at this part. So yeah. we had some problems with imports, but let's say once a month maybe less than that and that's fine for us so we don't want to do this heavy lifting but i got for mm. you this is maybe the right approach yeah. 
So sure, if, if you have a system that is very good at exporting data and then having consistent data, then for sure this is not really needed. Then I would also rather let the import fail and, and then they should fix this on their side. But uh, we had these issues really on a regular basis and this was causing too many problems then. Some more questions? I'm just impressed by the numbers. <laughs> but I think we can still bump this more. <laughs> yeah, probably. But as, as you just like said, um, there are always like very specific requirements for the project. So um, it's also about um, the landscape you have in the project. You might have this PIM system that you completely trust. Um, this is also what the data import is actually for, for data you already trust. And um, then you can um, yeah, also have the other where it's the data quality from um, whatever external system there might be. Maybe it's a different company, maybe it's um, a different department, or maybe it's just broken. Mm -hmm. And I uh, should not rely on that. Not always, at least. And the good thing here, I think, is um, that Spryker actually allowed to um, like evolve the whole thing in um, any direction that you need at that point. And I think that was a very good preparation work from Ethan. Definitely. It was a very good starting point uh, because I, I read the documentation in the beginning and then I saw, okay, there is this, um, this interface for this and this was explained how to do this. But then I saw in the, in the Spryker suite that there are already some exporters, uh, some importers, but processing importers not actively used, but the code was there. So this was a good starting point to get into this because I haven't worked with CTEs before. And first it looked a little bit scary to me and uh, a little bit yeah, complicated, but if you get used to it, then it's, it's pretty easy and uh, basically always the same. And uh, once we got really into this, we could um, also switch or, or convert the exporter, uh, the importers quite fast because it was mostly copy paste then just um, modifying the queries and even the, the logic for processing the PHP code was mostly the same. It's, it was pretty easy to do then. For us, the CTE and stuff was, was an eye opener. So we use this in a lot of places now in our code. For example, when we export all uh, product data into FactFinder, this is a whole yeah. big CTE. Yeah. And with that, we can build a table which we then export as CSV within a minute. We are talking about, oh, what is it? 350,000 products within a minute to export them. That's fast. That's fast enough, at, at least for us. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they are pretty, pretty nice. I know that in the sector of business intelligence, they use a lot of CTEs, or similar functionality to prepare their data. Maybe we can convince Martin uh, to also give a talk here. Martin, Martin Lutz from, yeah. Yeah. Um, cool, thank you, Bernd. Uh, if there are no okay. further questions. Okay. Bernd will not run away, I guess. No, definitely not. <laughs> Thanks. So, oops, where is the screen share? Uh, I should have stolen it oh, again. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so um, uh, from my side, there's not that much more to add here. So um, general question and answer part could be now, I guess we already addressed like the urgent things. Um, we are all available in, in Slack, in the community Slack. So you can also talk with each other. I would ask on these topics, keep the conversation public so that everyone um, has something um, from, from the learnings that we can take from there. Um, then uh, have you actually met Oscar? I'm not sure I'm allowed to use him yet. I'll probably see a lot more um, from him um, in the future. The next uh, meetup is probably only in January in 2021 because um, I will be uh, on longer vacation. Uh, maybe, I'm not sure he joined today, no, but um, maybe a colleague of mine can take a December one over. We, um, we will see. And um, the interesting thing is actually what we will talk about. So um, data import was like a topic that um, uh, many people have on their table. And we have a couple of others. Um, Esan told us um, a couple of weeks ago, 
some about um, the improvements we have for publishers. And um, I think um, there are a lot of uh, questions open in terms of Glue API. So maybe Glue API is a good topic for um, the next meetup. If you did something on your project that uh, addresses something around the Glue API and you are actually willing um, to share that and um, to, to give a talk about whatever you um, like used the Glue API for, maybe you um, like, like we did here, improved something. Um, maybe you just have like a, uh, an interesting um, way of using it. Um, maybe you just want to show the general advantages. So and there are always people here that maybe um, do not know um, all of the details around this. So you can um, yeah, just ping me uh, when you're interested to uh, talk about one of these aspects and maybe also when you want to hear about a certain aspect of that thing. Um, then please give us feedback, um, meetup at spryker.com or any other channel um, where you can find us, the Slack that I mentioned, for example, and I, I repeat again, um, please go to um, slackcommunity.spryker.com when you are not yet part of the Spryk, uh, Slack community. Um, otherwise, good that you already are. And um, yeah. Thank you for attending. Of course, special thanks to Alberto and Bernd for your contributions. Don't forget to wear your masks. There are way too many people out there who run around without masks. Wash your hands, stay healthy, and um, let's hope that we can um, get the numbers down. Uh, the whole day time, because I guess most of us will put time off and maybe even want to spend that with their families uh, without endangering them.